So good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sophia. I curate and organize learning events to bring the community and build um, the community together to, um, through learning at Spectrum. For those of you who are new to Spectrum, we are located at Duo Tower in Singapore. And aside from providing event spaces, we curate workspaces for the community experience, build connections to expand businesses. So for today's webinar, we'll be um, talking about responsible investing in Vietnam. And happy to have with us today, Craig Martin, chairman of Dynam Capital. He's involved in Vietnam for over 25 years and co-led the establishment of Dynam Capital in 2018. So Dynam Capital is a partner-owned business with asset management as a sole focus. Its investment strategy is based on research-driven fundamental analysis, seeking attractive companies that also demonstrate a commitment to ESG or environmental, social, and governance principles. So excuse me to trip my uh, voice over there. <laughs> so audience, if you have any questions, please post them onto the platform here. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Craig. Thank you very much. Great. Well, a very good morning uh, to all of you. Hope you're, you're keeping well. Um, Craig Martin, as uh, Sophia said. So I've had the pleasure of living in Southeast Asia for the last 27 years. Um, started out living in and working in Cambodia for several years uh, in a consulting business, advising investors into the emerging markets of Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, uh, and also uh, Burma, Myanmar. I then went off to actually learn what I was doing and did an MBA and joined Standard Chartered Bank in their private equity team, a co-founder of their uh, new private equity business. And that took us to very interesting parts of Asia, making lots of direct investments in companies. And one of the most interesting for me was back in Vietnam. Uh, we invested in a, a company that was playing well to the, the growing consumerism, even back in 2002 in Vietnam. Uh, I got re-enamored with Vietnam, and so I moved my family uh, to Vietnam in 2004, uh, where we lived for about five years. Sorry, 2005, we lived there for five years, where I worked for another UK company, Prudential, um, investing Vietnamese people's insurance money in Vietnam. Prudential's now East Spring. I then joined a regional business called Cap Asia, investing in infrastructure across Asia from Pakistan all the way to the Philippines and included Vietnam as well. Uh, and Cap Asia had a lot of focus on ESG, which I'll come on to later. After about seven years, uh, co CEO of Cap Asia, once again drawn back to Vietnam. So uh, I joined uh, with a fantastic Vietnamese guy called Tin. Uh, to co-found Dynam Capital, and the journey we're on, uh, as described, is managing uh, client money, investments in Vietnam, but looking to do so in a very responsible manner. So I'm going to take you through a presentation uh, this morning. Let's hope you can all see on the, the share screen. I'm going to talk a little bit about Vietnam, just to set us on uh, the same page uh, and why Vietnam is an attractive place to be investing and what are the challenges associated with its terrific growth um, over the last few years and what does the future mean for uh, an emerging market like Vietnam. Then to talk about responsible investing in terms of its evolution. It's much more popular and well known now. Why is that? Uh, and how did it start? And what does it really mean in practice? And then I'll talk a little bit about how we apply the concepts of responsible investing in Vietnam in a day-to-day -day basis, what difference it makes to us. And then finally, just as we're coming towards the end of the year, a chance to kind of reflect and ask ourselves about our own journey with respect to what responsible investing might mean for us as individuals with the monies that we invest, if we entrust those to other people or we do it ourselves or professionally uh, through our companies or our organizations. And then there'll be a time for Q and A. So I'll talk in total for about 40, 45 minutes uh, across those themes. So Vietnam 
has come through an incredible journey in the last 30 years. As we all know, it's clearly a part of Southeast Asia. It's a member of ASEAN. It joined ASEAN 25 years ago. If you recall, 25 years ago, Vietnam was really coming out of the, um, of the woods in the sense that uh, until 95, it didn't have uh, economic establishment with the US, still legacies back to uh, the American War, uh, where Vietnam fought with America, and wasn't uh, considered a key part of, of Southeast Asia. It was not trusted, to be quite frank. But in 95, became part of ASEAN. And this year, it's the chairman of ASEAN. Vietnam's a, a large population, close to 100 million people, a young population, increasingly digitally connected and highly literate. Vietnam's different to other parts of, of Southeast Asia, and, and you may have visited, you may be very familiar with Vietnam or you may not, but one of, one of the points which I think is important is it has, has a significant single ethnicity. And that's been part of the reason I think why Vietnam's been able to control COVID, not just so much the ethnicity, but that it's a, a socialist structure, <clears throat> a kind of centrally organized um, social structure, very cohesive. And so the people are pulled together and have managed to defeat uh, three or four strains and attacks of COVID during this year. Compare that perhaps, say, to Myanmar or Burma, where there are 150 different ethnicities, where it's much harder to pull the people together. And there, of course, Aung San Suu Kyi has had a difficult job. But Vietnam, much more straightforward. It's a rapidly urbanizing uh, economy and country, although the urbanization rate is less than 40%. Now that's where Western Europe was before the Second World War. So there's still a long way to go on that urbanization journey. It provides a lot of opportunities for investors, but also, as you can imagine, has challenges too. Vietnam has grown its GDP and has lifted its people from, from poverty over the last 30 years. And in those three decades, uh, the GDP has grown on average of six to seven percent a year. And that's been largely driven by significant amounts of foreign direct investment. People investing in Vietnam largely for manufacturing for export, at least in the last, in the first two decades. Uh, more recently, manufacturing also now for the domestic market, which is growing and growing wealthier. So that foreign direct investment has come in. Uh, Vietnam has opened itself up to trade opportunities. Uh, so it is very open for trade. It has signed a number of bilateral trade agreements, most recently with the European Union, the EU Free Trader Agreement. The UK, which obviously we all know has got about 27 days to complete to get Brexit done. Uh, when it does that, it needs bilateral trade agreements. And so Dominic Rabb was out in Vietnam about a month ago to try and copy paste the EU's successful free trade agreement for the UK. But in addition to these bilateral trade agreements, Vietnam has opened itself up to these regional and global agreements. Two weeks ago, it signed the RCEP or RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership which is the first regional trade deal that China's been invited to be part of. So it's a very in interesting trade agreement. And Vietnam has also been a, a founding part of what was known before as the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's now a, a jumbled uh, let of let, let set of letters, CP, TPP, I think, in the, in the latest iteration. So it's an open economy, um, increasingly so. That growth in GDP has meant actually that the per capita GDP in Vietnam uh, has reached a very important point. So three decades of, of growth, and the GDP this year, I should say, is gonna be lower than 6% uh, because of COVID this year, the, the Vietnamese economy will only expand by about two and a half percent, only in the sense that it's one of very few countries in the world where their economies are expanding. Here in Singapore, we've seen our economy contract, <clears throat> Thailand uh, and the rest of the world in contraction. Only China really and Vietnam have seen expansion. But by next year, in 2021, Vietnam will be back on that uh, path of six to seven percent GDP growth. On a per capita basis, this year it's crossed that three thousand dollar per capita mark. Now, when I first started investing 
in Vietnam in 2002, 2003, um, with Standard Chartered and then with Prudential. Uh, the per capita GDP was $1,000. It just gone through $1,000 per capita. And Prudential got very excited because we could sell a lot of life insurance policies and then invest those money because people uh, were at that level on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, getting wealthier. So it's trebled now, it's $3,000 per capita. When Thailand hit that level, it then saw a doubling again in about seven years. And when China hit that level, it saw a doubling in five years. So it's typically an inflection point in consumer behavior. So many more consumers will be added to Vietnam's uh, human capital stock over the next 10, 15 years. And we see that um, shown through in things like car ownership, so traffic on roads, um, consumer loans, people buying uh, household electronic goods using uh, higher purchase or consumer finance, significant amounts of domestic air traffic and also international traffic when things normalize. At the moment, you and I can't go into Vietnam readily without having two weeks of quarantine. And also changes in behavior, modern trade, so people shopping at um, convenience stores and supermarkets and hypermarkets. That's increased dramatically in the last 20, 25 years, now about 30%. And we've seen some evidence that partly because of uh, the COVID, people's kind of fears around wet markets, the traditional wet markets, which in Vietnam are you know, very different to the wet markets we have here in Singapore, have uh, changed. So people are wanting to still do their daily fresh purchase of fish, chicken, Kalang and what have you, but increasingly happy to do that in a more modern environment. So that modern trade prevents tremendous investment opportunities, but it's also a changing dynamic. And obviously modern trade tends to involve more plastic and more wrapping, and that has uh, societal issues as well. As mentioned, Prudential, we got very excited selling life insurance um, in the early part of, of, of the noughties. And even today, there's a greater participation of Vietnamese people in domestic financial products. So life insurance, uh, also participants in the stock market. 75% of the stock market is owned by Vietnamese uh, people, only 25% by foreign investors. So the retail, retail sales are growing and the economy is growing and digitalizing. But in all of this growth, clearly there can be some challenges, and these are common in many emerging markets. It's not just Vietnam. So on the environment, increased plastic waste. Uh, the mighty Mekong that comes through Vietnam is one of the rivers in, one of the top 10 rivers in the world that has plastic waste at significant levels. The Vietnamese coastline is very long. There's a lot of plastic waste that washes in from uh, all over the world onto the coastline. Air pollution, if you've been to Hanoi, particularly in the winter, you'll have been wearing masks for the last several years because of the air pollution has been very bad. Road traffic, um, you've got to just walk, walk across the road and let the motorbikes go past. You don't overthink it, otherwise you'll get flattened. Uh, sadly, there was a, an expert on road traffic, this is a true story, in Hanoi, and he was trying to overthink it, and actually he got knocked over and killed trying to cross the road in Hanoi. Congested living areas, densely populated areas, food safety, water safety, and potentially shortcuts in build quality in infrastructure and buildings. So if you ask, and um, we've surveyed uh, Vietnamese people, we've surveyed women and, and, and younger teens, and their main concerns in life are around food safety, water safety, and access to education for their kids from, from the, the mother's perspective. So these are important issues in an emerging growing economy such as Vietnam. Growth also can acerbate levels of poverty and, and, and the divide, the rich and poor. We see that in all countries. We even see, obviously see it in Singapore as well. And a digital divide. Thankfully, Vietnam is digitalizing, but still this is an issue where uh, digital becomes much more part of our life. Trafficking. Uh, human trafficking. Uh, last December, that dreadful incident where a number of Vietnamese uh, nationals were in a freezer truck and died in the UK, uh, being trafficked to work 
uh, in nail spas and ma manicure spas in the UK. Exploitation of labor, it's obviously an increasing issue globally, but um, you know, an emerging market, Vietnam and others, this can be an issue. Inequality, broadly defined. Changes in culture as, a, as an economy modernizes. And mental health. And then governance, um, concerns around corruption as economies are growing quickly. Is, that, is there a path to faster profits? Is there an equal playing field? Or in Vietnam, there are some sectors and companies that have foreign restrictions. So uh, you as a foreign investor would have to probably pay 20 to 50% more to buy a share than uh, a local Vietnamese investor in some instances. Front running, so information asymmetry. Someone knows more about something you want to buy and gets in the queue and chokes a place ahead of you. Again, this is not uh, specific to Vietnam. Weak disclosure of information, ambiguous or sometimes not very un ambiguous related party transactions, perhaps not well disclosed. Uh, weak reporting and fraud. Now these are temporal, these are all improving in Vietnam and we're active in that uh, journey. Clearly points to look at in any emerging market in Vietnam particularly. And this plays to these three dimensions, environment, social governance, which is a key part of the whole responsible investing movement. So that movement, it's obviously much more popular and we're more familiar with it. We hear a lot about it. There's a lot of jargon, ESG, PRI, SDG, greenwashing, you're probably hearing about that too. And then well, what, is, what does it mean to be impactful, to be responsible, or to be sustainable? Can you do all of that and still be profitable? Yes, I think is the answer. Uh, but it's not clear how all of these impact every business and every investor. It's getting clearer, uh, but it's been a journey. So a little bit about that journey. Back in, uh, in the mid 90s, John Alkinton was attributed with coining the phrase triple bottom line of people, planet and profit. And how you can look to measure your impact on those dimensions. It's, it's really an accounting framework. It's being criti criticized by some as not being very effective or not very easy to implement. But at least it starts by looking at social responsibility of businesses what the environmental impact might be, and what's the economic value. At the time, it was controversial. I think it was Friedman that says, you know, a, a company just exists to make profit for its shareholders. Some person's morality or ethical choices around other things, such as society, is separate to that. But there's been a, a movement against Friedman and, and, and those kind of thinking. These frameworks and triple bottom line largely ignored. Um, outside of non-government organizations and development agencies. But a few uh, notable exceptions, the development finance institutions, people like DEG from Germany, IFC, part of the World Bank, uh, Propaco from France, uh, FMO from the Netherlands, and SIFEM from, from Switzerland. These DFIs have been very instrumental in Asia, in Vietnam and other parts of, of emerging Asia, in investing, uh, taking risk, but also creating a very strong culture about ESG among newer fund managers, uh, encouraging them and forcing them in some ways to consider and incorporate such thinking into their asset allocation, their investment review and appraisal and monitoring and performance. And so many of those newer fund managers uh, perhaps are now managing the second, their third fund and have that culture and approach to responsible investing. In the 90s also, uh, many environmental impact assessments had to be done uh, you know, for infrastructure. This was mandated by IFC, World Bank and ADB. So if you wanted to get a project off the ground, you wanted to get debt financing and equity financing, you needed to do these studies and you needed to think about the impact of the business or the project more holistically. And these entities alongside many commercial banks agreed a set of principles, the equator principles, 
really for lending, lending to projects. Um, and that also continued to drive this narrative. Who remembers 2000? Um, we were worried about the millennium bug, weren't we? And computers crashing because of shortcuts in, in programming in, in the 70s and 80s. And the Millennium Dome, uh, I have a flat in London where my daughter's living that overlooks this. She sees this every day. It's still there 20 years later. Uh, I think people laughed at it and laughed at Tony Blair when he was um, building this back in 2000. But in 2000, the United Nations took stock, as we should all do at the end of a year and at the end of a, uh, of a millennium and at the end of a decade, around you know, what could the world be doing better? and came up with a series of these goals, such as eradicating extreme poverty and hunger, achieve universal uh, primary education levels, promote gender equality and empowerment of women, reduce child mortality, improve maternal health, combat HIV, AIDS, malaria and tuberculosis, ensure environmental sustainability and develop global partnerships. So these were, everyone agreed to these excitedly in 2000 and they were meant to have been complete by 2015. Uh, they weren't. A number of countries did get behind them in very significant ways. Others ignored them or paid lip service or, or struggled with some of these. Clearly there were success stories and you know, on some of these elements, the private sector has been very involved. Bill Gates, the Melinda Gates Foundation, it really done a fantastic job on many things, particularly around malaria in some of these areas. And there have been tremendous strides in HIV AIDS. But if you saw the news in Singapore today, I think 170 people this year have been infected by HIV AIDS. Gladly more treatments are available, but still these issues weren't fully addressed. And nor could they be. They're very lofty ambitions. But these ended in 2015. Uh, the Millennium Dome is still there. Next chat we'll see in this video failed at something spectacularly um, and caused somewhat of a, an awakening in 2006. Look at the 10 hottest years ever measured. They've all occurred in the last 14 years. And the hottest of all was 2005. The scientific consensus is that we are causing global warming. I am Al Gore. I used to be the next president of the United States of America. This is Patagonia 75 years ago and the same glacier today. This is Mount Kilimanjaro 30 years ago and last year. Within the decade, there will be no more snows of Kilimanjaro. This is really not a political issue so much as a moral issue. Temperature increases are taking place all over the world and that's causing stronger storms. This is the biggest crisis in the history of this country. Early this morning, Hurricane Katrina slammed into New Orleans. Is it possible that we should prepare against other threats besides terrorists? From Paramount Classics comes a film that has shocked audiences everywhere they've seen it. The Arctic is experiencing faster melting. If this were to go, sea level worldwide would go up 20 feet. This is what would happen in Florida. Around Shanghai, home to 40 million people. The area around Calcutta, 60 million. Here's Manhattan. The World Trade Center Memorial would be underwater. Think of the impact of a couple hundred thousand refugees, and then imagine a hundred million. We have to act together to solve this global crisis. ability to live is what is at stake. So at least he was a good loser, right? But that really woke everyone up in, in a significant way in 2006. In the same year, <clears throat> the United Nations again came up with a set of 
principles for how we could look at being responsible investors and encouraged investors and asset owners to sign up to these various principles. So incorporating ESG ideas into investment uh, decision-making processes, being active owners of assets rather than passive, looking to get disclosure by things that we invest in around ESG issues, promoting acceptance and implementation of these principles more broadly in the investment industry, and working together in a collaborative manner to implement the principles, and reporting on them, how we're we doing uh, an internal and external scorecards. So again, the UN, it, perhaps in, the, in, in taking a very sensible approach uh, launched an initiative which has become very much uh, the mainstream for the investment management industry. That was in 2006. Kind of the decade went on fairly quietly. Um, then I think the next woke moment was in 2017. So David Attenborough's Blue Planet 2, if you remember it shocked audiences worldwide over the issue of plastic. Um, so whereas Al Gore had looked at kind of the last polar bear on a single floating block of ice. So David Attenborough was around uh, turtles and fish and, and animals suffocating because of our waste uh, through plastic. And obviously in parallel, people like Greta Thunberg and others really got uh, the world's attention around the environment um, and linked into this, of course, things such as the Paris Climate Accords, uh, and building greater consensus around the E in ESG, or the environmental aspect. In 2016, here in Singapore, there's another dome, uh, our national stadium. Singapore put in place uh, several very straightforward and clear principles for responsible investing. I, I like these a lot. I think they're, they're very neat. Take a stand and establish and articulate policies know your investment and communicate with your portfolio companies. Be active, monitor things, don't put blinkers on and shut, shut your eyes. Understand that conflicts can emerge, um, have policies to deal with them and uphold transparency when managing them. Vote responsibly. We all, if we are investors, we have the opportunity even as passive investors in investment funds sold to us by private bankers here in Singapore, you have the ability to exercise your voting rights. Set a good example, document what you're doing, update activities. And again, this concept of we're all in it together, perhaps you know, there is no planet B, working together, engaging responsibly with others. And then in 2016, the UN, if you remember those Millennium Goals, they finished in 2015. So they were then replaced with a new set of sustainable development goals. And these 17 goals, no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth industry innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below the water, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions, and partnership for the goals. So they've broadened to 17 goalposts. And the aim that these will help deliver sustainable development by 2030, which isn't tomorrow. It's not that long away, right? And they're very wide ranging. Clearly they cover poverty, they go through gender equality and climate change. We can expect to see more companies measuring and reporting their objectives against these ambitious targets. So if ESG has become more mainstream perhaps, uh, and people are more familiar with that as a concept, it can be a bit nebulous. Whereas these goals from the United Nations, the SDGs, a little bit more ambitious, but you can measure to a certain extent uh, what you as a company or you as an investor are seeing your companies do on each of these dimensions.
Only 6% of businesses have full visibility of their supply chain, which means a lot of harmful practices still go unnoticed. That's not good enough. At Standard Chartered, we're working with businesses to adopt responsible supply chain standards. By doing so, we help ensure that the things you buy are made the right way. Because we're not here for good enough. We're Standard Chartered, and we're here for good. So this is the 2020 campaign of Standard Chartered. I, I think here for good, I think it's a fantastic um, program and a fantastic set of ads. The uh, reason I mention that is you can see corporations becoming more specific now and targeting areas that they want to promote, and why not, but also highlight issues that are relevant. And there's a lot of overlap with the SDGs uh, as well as broadly on ESG. So here for good. So PRI, the Principles for Responsible Investing, which I mentioned just uh, a couple of minutes ago, when it started in 2006, um, it started to gain attraction. At Dynam Capital uh, and the fund we manage, Vietnam Holding, they were a fairly early adopter in, they've been a, a signatory for, for 10 years. But today there's close to $100 trillion under management by asset owners or, or fund managers that have signed up to the United Nations PRI. Uh, so there's more than 3,000, 3,100 signatories to that. So it's much more mainstream. So environmental social gov governance is definitely here for good, no getting away from it. The consideration of material environmental or social governance into investment decisions is to help enhance risk adjusted returns. Governance issues about board, concision, board composition, supply chain practices, environmental aspects, emissions, water usage, waste management. This is very recent. This is a letter from BlackRock to investors. Um, I received my copy of this yesterday. So they're now saying that they manage $7 trillion uh, and they're making all of their funds have this focus around ESG. They're saying, don't worry, it doesn't change your investment policy and investment kind of returns. And in fact, it's a risk management tool. It's going to enhance returns uh, on a risk adjusted basis. And then the other quote adheres, we will adhere to principle based exclusion framework. And we'll change the name of one of our funds from Asia Focus Fund to Sustainable Asia Equity Fund. This is Fidelity, another major investor. They manage $3 trillion. And also this is very recent. So ESG is definitely here now. It's mainstream. It's been adopted by these large asset owners. Uh, myself, my colleague have perhaps been battling at it in different areas for, for a number of years. But again, we still think that this is the right way to go. ESG is about enhancing your risk adjusted returns. And good businesses, good business. The tools can help identify, manage, as well as measure and help you report on risks. Having a goal and a framework can actually help the investment decision making process. It can help you select uh, the good uh, and the best from the poor and the weak. Investors and stakeholders will demand more attention to responsible and sustainable investing. Yes, there'll be a fad. There's concerns about greenwashing where people claim to have all of these things in place and don't really pay lip service. There will be that, that's inevitable. But also very importantly, regulators, governments, stakeholders more broadly, customers, family members, will punish us or, or reward us in the future or, on the steps that we take as corporate investors or indeed as individual investors. So that was the journey of responsible investing from you know, the mid nineties when it was fairly abstract uh, and practiced by a few number of people through the millennium period where it got a little bit more focus and attention 
and some more frameworks coming out. And then in the last two, three years, sustainable investing, responsible investing, ESG is now day-to-day -day part of all of our lives, particularly in the investment world. So when you look at an emerging market like Vietnam, where we spend all of our time, how do we apply those principles? So we're a fund manager, that's me and that's my colleague, Tim. I think a lot of this has to start at the top. So both myself and Tim believe that ESG and responsible investing, we're not doing it to do good per se. That's a, a, maybe a parallel objective, but the primary objective is its risk management and should help deliver superior risk adjusted returns. We have to believe in it, um, otherwise you're not being authentic in delivering it. Tin has a great deal of authenticity. He co-founded the Vietnam Institute of Directors. So the G in ESG, the governance, is something we really focus on a lot. And Tin has a very authentic voice and is listened to by the chairwomen and the chairman and the CEOs of our portfolio companies as we engage with them. Now, 10 years ago, Tin was talking to a set of people that really didn't understand what ESG was about. So we had to organize events and seminars. And even now we organize round tables and sessions on better governance uh, and understanding carbon footprint on the E aspect in ESG. And so there's a real focus uh, around that. Tin in his spare time lectures and trains people who want to be company directors in Vietnam. So very much engaged on the ground and recognizing that this is a, a journey. We have a relatively young team, 50% women, 50% men. They also have to believe in what we're doing. Otherwise they won't be authentic in, in the monitoring and the research and how we build our portfolios and in our reporting on the operation side. So everyone has to be in it. You have to educate yourself educate your teams and educate your, your clients. So as mentioned, we were very early, our fund was a very early signatory, um, the first in Vietnam actually, for over a decade we were a signatory. And then made sure that we could build those ESG factors very much into our full process of when we're selecting a company, investing in it, monitoring it, exiting it. And this year, for, for last year's work, we, we received some good scores um, in, in the PRI annual report, three A's, enough to get me into a nice university, <clears throat> better A grades than I got in my A levels. But important to make that responsible investing an integral part of our business. And again, we can't do everything. So you pick your battles. And we've really focused a lot on this dynamic um, approach, this engagement with our portfolio companies face-to-face -face meetings, talking with them about best practice, helping them understand where the world is going, as well as you know, introducing them to great initiatives, such as people who want to reduce plastic waste, seeing if there are opportunities, bringing in consultants to help them look at their energy optimization and rooftop solar and these kind of things. So we're very much both top down, we think the Vietnam Vietnam market is very attractive. We look at the key sectors and in industrialization, urbanization, and the consumer, but then also very much bottom up to identify those small few companies that we're going to put in our portfolio and those that are on a better trajectory regarding ESG. In Vietnam today, there's more than 1,600 public companies to choose from if you want to invest. Um, we think there's an investable universe for our strategy, probably about 100 companies, maybe 150 at a push. But there are only 25 in our portfolio. So we're very selective around that and disciplined, but recognize these companies are on a journey. So some don't follow those principles fully and we encourage and educate. And we've seen some great stories where portfolio companies have actually taken the medicine and have benefited from it. And we've seen some where they haven't. And ultimately we will exit those companies if they don't make uh, a real effort and a concerted effort to do better on those dimensions. So you've got to be very detailed, uh, particularly investing other people's money is a great responsibility and processing carefully through that investment journey is important. It's an iterative process of review and we review on a weekly basis how we're doing against 
uh, how our, each of our portfolio companies are performing. It's also important to communicate what you do, and that's part of actually the PRI framework is in informing stakeholders. So for our fund, we help them establish a, a committee, an environmental social governance committee, a committee of the main board, um, and then have its own terms of reference to really focus for the fund that we manage on the activities around those dimensions of ESG, and then how we report on that. So that's intentionally loud uh, because we, we use that to, when we got those scores, to communicate. We used it as marketing, yes. Um, and we used it to communicate that we do adhere to those principles. So it can be a competitive advantage as well. And that's a commercial attribute, which is not a counter to any of the ambitions of being more responsible investing. So we've applied as a fund manager, the principles of responsible investing in Vietnam, and we keep at it. Um, and we see you know, good results and good growth in Vietnam. But I thought I would just spend a couple of minutes to kind of encourage us all to think through this, particularly as we come towards the end of the year about our own journey. We're all allocators of capital in some shape or form. So directionally, where, where do we want to get to in either allocating our own capital or the capital of organizations we're involved with or resources of those organizations? And how do you want to get there? There are many ways to, to choose to, to go from A to B. There are shortcuts and there are longer journeys and there are more efficient ways to float to your destination. And where do you sit on the spectrum? Um, whether you're in now or in the future, in a, on the far right, a traditional for-profit enterprise or a corporation that has been effective in practicing social responsibility, or maybe a socially responsible business or a social enterprise, or a not-profit that has some income generating activities, or a genuine pure not-profit. And there are some blurrings across this spectrum. Where are you? Where do you want to be in your current organization? Where do you want to take that? Or in future, where, where might you end up? And what is important to you? Cole, do you think your portfolios or companies you're involved in should have some or none? It's cheap electricity but it's polluting. Oil, the same thing, it's a hydrocarbon, less pollutive than coal and clearly needed. So is some okay in your portfolio or do you want none in your portfolio? Gas, LNG is gonna be a, a very affordable form of energy for countries like Vietnam. Uh, it's still a hydrocarbon, it's still combusted. Thankfully it's waste product is just water, uh, but does have one single carbon atom. So there is a, a CO2 aspect as well. What's your views on gambling and gaming? What about guns, munitions? Great business models, defensive, high margin, but clearly they have a, a negative impact on the recipients of them. Ganja, marijuana in the UK, US, uh, many companies now looking to invest in this, medical marijuana, recreational marijuana. What do you feel about that? Tobacco, high margin, great growth, consumer product, uh, low valuation, great cash generating yield. Do you want it in your portfolio? Alcohol, do you like it? Consume it? These aren't moral questions. Do you want to be investing in companies that have that? If so, yes. Do, you know, within 5% of the portfolio, within 50% of their portfolio, beer versus hard liquor versus none. So these are all dimensions for you to think through. Fair wages, is that important? Fair employment practices, fair trade. Maybe more expensive coffee, but fair trade. Gender diversity across all elements of that. Transparency, do you want to know more clearly about the portfolio and the companies you're invested in? The sympathies with Greta Thunberg and you know, the, the, the concerns of Sir David Attenborough on low plastics kind of took a bit of a back seat, didn't it, during COVID. Back in 2019, we were all kind of looking at ways to not use straws, not use plastics, and COVID came along and everything's single use, deliveries and more plastic. Um, 
I hope we haven't lost the ability to kind of turn back that tide and climate action more generally broadly defined. And circular economy, reduce, reuse, recycle. So these are all considerations. So look at it in your own investing, your own practices, your own portfolio and decide what you're happy with because you'll see more choice. You'll see more companies prepared to offer you information on what they're doing and maybe even to select with some of these robo advisories, businesses that you can invest in uh, or find through your fund managers, businesses that, or, or other fund managers that, that adhere to practices that are aligned with what you think are important. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me uh, around any of these dimensions. So with that, we'll have a chance for some Q&A. Thank you, Craig. That was really insightful for um, me and uh, I think as individuals, um, it's an awakening. So uh, for us, I think if we were to uh, able to contribute um, well enough to for a difference that we will make for our children's future as well. So ESG has been a topic that um, has been around for some time. So basically, understand that uh, for Vietnam itself, um, it's done so well during the COVID-19 uh, with 6 to 7% growth, uh, GDP growth, and but comes its challenges with urbanization, right, with, uh, and, and population growth as well. Perhaps you want to share more with us on that point, please? Yeah, so Vietnam, high, high growth this year will be 2.5%, not the 6, but next year it'll be 6%. So the high growth generates um great returns for investors but as an economy grows it's changing there's a lot of infrastructure developments in vietnam and that is a multiplier effect it's new infrastructure so it's a, a new metro or mrt system that suddenly opens up a new community uh, whereas perhaps you had a 45 minute uh, take your life in your hands motor journey in the morning to commute into ho chi minh city for example mm -hmm. when the metro is finally opened it'll be a safer journey um, and so the areas you're living will become more popular. Um, real estate prices go up, um, housing benefits, and there'll be um, more shops and modern trade. So that's a terrific multiplier effect for an economy. And it's good to see that a lot of that new infrastructure is coming in with uh, green financing anticipated. Even in the ports in Vietnam, we're investing in, in one of the largest port operators, Gemadep in Vietnam, and they're looking that their new ports are green ports. So around their, their processes and their impact on the environment and the finance that they're looking to take to be more uh, responsibly sourced uh, and managed and monitored. So that growth, there will be issues. You've got a consumer society again, modern trade is also about plastic wrappings as, as I mentioned and, and the waste to that. So it's how do you recycle? How do you close the loop? Um, there, there's a great Singapore based uh, entity, uh, the Alliance Against Plastic Waste, and they're looking at community levels in places like Vietnam and the Philippines and where else, how to really address uh, ocean and river waste, plastic waste, and recycle that and put that back into the circular economy. And we're looking at ways to kind of partner with people like that. So in that, I think it's important to kind of select a battle. Um, so we're really focused a lot on the G, on the governance. We spent the early years on the E, communicating the value used to that and I think that's more understood. Vietnam's quite a low-lying geography uh, and the Vietnamese consumers themselves want clean water, clean food and safe environment for, for raising their families. So there's a consumer push which is great. Uh, the G I think is something that we can be very authentic in in helping improve in Vietnam on that governance side and that's really because you know my business partner Tin has that authentic voice in corporate governance is listened to and we can train and advocate on best practices there. So pick your battles. And for us, yeah, the governance one is one we're really keen on. The S, we didn't talk so much around that, CSR and the S. Vietnam has a lot of that already, partly because of its Confucian ethic and you know, the greater good practice around its people and population and that cohesiveness. So Vietnamese companies have been doing a lot of that for quite some time. And it's been very good to see that during this COVID year, they've looked a lot more at that S around suppliers, stakeholders, staff, uh, and how to look after those people during uh, the brief periods of lockdown in Vietnam in 
in April and then again in August. And through the year, as Vietnam's come together to really kind of battle coronavirus. So there are a number of different dimensions which are a consequence of Vietnam's terrific growth uh, and its prospects. We think it's a great market to be looking at from an investment perspective. Uh, stock market up, portfolio could grow at 20% next year. And is relatively cheap on a price earnings basis. It's less than nine times. So good, good value for good growth in Vietnam and prospects for next year look positive. That's great to hear as well. So um, there are requests um, from our audience as well, Craig, if um, one says, I uh, hope the slides will be shared with the participants. And then great overview as well. Um, a lot of requests to, uh, for, for your slides because of the great overview that you have provided. So we'll, we'll take that offline as well. My so, pleasure, um, yeah. So you mentioned about the social uh, part so pick your battles um yep. the three parts of esg and social is the the area where it's an interesting part that you can um, look into as well so coming into the prospects of 2021 and the resilience that vietnam um, has uh, facing COVID 19. so two questions we have uh, from the attendees as well uh, what's your view on the water and aquaculture sector in vietnam and second part of the question is any names of Vietnamese companies taking ESG seriously on those sectors? Good question. Yeah, great question. So aquaculture is very important in, in Vietnam. It's uh, one of the world's largest uh, exporters, producers of aquaculture. Um, and historically aquaculture is, it, it's a balance. It, if you put it in the, through the lens of the social development goals, it uh, re replaces uh, a lot of sea corp fish and is more sustainable but it's also fed through fish as the part of the animal feed going through that process and historically there you know there have been issues where poor management of the resource has ended up with some pollution um, of the local areas around that but vietnam's been at it quite some time so it's, the industry as a whole has got a lot better um, so the aquaculture of farmed fish uh, and farmed shrimp uh, they're exported to Japan, the UK, uh, US is a lot better. Part of that's consumer pushback as well. Um, in, in the early, in the mid 90s, you know, people looking to use antibiotics in fish, they're banned in the EU. So eventually that got um, removed entirely from the, the process in Vietnam. Uh, antibiotics that were banned, that is. And practices of um, kind of uh, using polyphenols to boost up the weight of the fish when it's frozen. You get this nice frozen fish, you defrost it and put it in the oven and suddenly you've got nothing left. They, they were the early parts of this growing industry. It's a massive industry. Uh, so now it's a lot better. And the, best, the better companies, and some of them are listed, uh, we, we own some shares and one of them is, is doing really well in, in that dimension of looking at um, its impact in terms of its ponds uh, reducing the mortality of its uh, livestock as well of its fish around that so that that, that dimension is is getting better uh, but it's something we, we looked at very closely spent a lot of time reviewing before we invested uh, in that sector in terms generally um, some some names some of the well-known names are doing a great job so Vina milk which is you know Vietnam's largest uh, dairy uh, distributor has was one of the first kind of listed companies and, and one of the first companies really to take governance to a high degree and bring in non-exec directors. So very strong on the governance side and also is very strong on the CSR aspect uh, and more broadly looking at its environmental activities. Uh, Mobile World, which is a, a great omni-channel business in, in Vietnam. It started out as a retailer of uh, mobile phones, hence the name, and accessories, and then moved into consumer electronics, a bit like a, you know, a Quartz or a Harvey Norman or something like that, but more on the consumer electronics. And then finally, its last leg is in grocery, um, a fair price type grocery, but combining digital and uh, click and collect and, and e-commerce through, through that platform. They, they're focused a lot around uh, the S this year, around their staff, their suppliers, good hygiene, dealing with products. Uh, and they're trying to, they recognize that they're also, they use a lot of plastic in terms of shopping bags and that grocery side, but they're looking at ways to reduce that 
uh, and recycle and use recycled materials. There are also a couple of um, interesting uh, businesses in, in water and water treatment. We, we own a couple of them. Um, and they're obviously helping provide clean, safe water to the population. Even in businesses such as garments, and Vietnam's a big exporter of garment and textiles, a number of them are look, trying to use uh, recycled yarns and materials into the Nike trainers or into their clothes. Part of this kind of closed or, or circular economy link. And our second largest company um, is a steel company. Now steel obviously is not always associated with low carbon because you're producing a material that has to involve energy and heating up um, raw materials uh, and, or heating up rebar and making, heating up billets rather to make rebar. Um, yet it's closing its loop and steel is a fully recycled material as well. Um, and it's trying to look at ways to be more energy efficient in its process and platform. So many of our top names, uh, particularly in the industrial and the consumer side, see the CSR as really important and they try and use that as, as a differentiator in their own businesses and in their communications, uh, are adapting to the E and looking to report more on that as well as improving on the G. We helped, or my colleague Tin helped through the Vietnam Institute of Directors uh, and IFC to come up with a corporate code of good uh, governance in uh, last August, which was released, and then how to train companies in our portfolio around those guidelines. So again, on that corporate governance, things are getting better on that journey in, in Vietnam. So most of our portfolio, are, uh, you know, doing a lot around those dimensions. And there are some good names. So generally, yeah, Vina Milk, Mobile World uh, would be businesses that people are aware of. Um, Gemadep, the port business is also growing. And the banks, the banks in Vietnam are doing very well uh, too. And we like logistics, we like financial services, consumer companies, and also some good real estate developers that are looking at uh, green buildings and not having individual aircon units, but doing kind of district cooling, district heating. So some innovation as well. Great. So, um, yeah, so the banks and regulators are now um, also focusing on green finance, green bonds as well that we're aware of. Um, so I'm going to flip things a little bit. If you are able to share with us, what are the, those investments that are not positive or does not get through um, your approval? So basically things like greenwashing that you mentioned or certain investments that they're looking uh, that they want to invest in. So are you able to share a case study, but uh, with definitely, of course, not mentioning of names? Yeah, well, look, I'll give two examples, um, <clears throat> both around transparency and investor relations. So company A had very poor investor relations transparency. We like the sector, it was very profitable. Uh, we nagged them um, at senior levels that they needed to focus on this, provided some training opportunities for them, investor relations and in communicating with stakeholders. They didn't see the need, they're so profitable. They thought, you know, if I tell everyone how profitable I am, then I'm gonna get more competition. Mm -hmm. uh, we said, unfortunately, you're a listed company, you need to do this. Uh, thankfully, over time they did, and they, they've really boosted their IR activities, uh, and that helps with liquidity uh, and getting more investors in the stock, which helps us. So it's selfish. Uh, we want them to do that because we want more liquidity and we want the stock to be better known, better rated, and the value to go up for our investors. And they got it, so tick. There's another company, um, again, great sector. We, uh, we liked it a lot, but they wouldn't answer our calls. Um, they wouldn't, and we weren't pestering them. They wouldn't meet with our CEO. They wouldn't meet with our investment team. And we thought this is a bit odd. So we internally put a red flag against them. We were already invested. Typically we invest a, a certain level of the portfolio, maybe 2%. And then over time, our conviction, as we get more aware of what they're doing as a management team, we'll invest more and we might go up as high as 8%. So this one, we're at the low level, but we were not happy with that response. Um, and they refused to meet us again. And so we started to sell the stock. And then when we came to COVID, the very beginning, back in February this year, we met with all of our portfolio companies to see how they were doing and were they thinking about this. And this one company was caught like a, a you know, rabbit in, in the headlights and they didn't have a clear sense for what they would think about what they would prioritize 
when the world was going into issues. So around, you know, they, they were going to see they're a manufacturer for export. They were going to see their supply chain get disrupted and their customers cancel orders and they weren't prepared for that. Um, and, and we finally, we, we cut the position then because we'd seen the warning sign, we'd red flagged them. We weren't going to add any more to them. They didn't improve and then we exited them. Now, it wasn't always an easy decision because these are still profitable businesses. But we're saying, look, something's gone. We don't, the trust has gone or they're not following our best practice. Uh, so, you know, let's, let's vote with our feet. So that, that, that was two examples around that IR, the investor relations transparency dimension, which is important for us as an investor. Uh, one where we're happy and they've continued uh, and one where we weren't happy and we exited. Definitely. Thank you for sharing um, on, on those projects and also a great presentation from uh, Craig. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Dynam Capital. Thank you, audience, for joining us today. So if you have any questions that you'd like to um, ask Craig further, you can reach out to me or you can reach out to Craig. Craig's on LinkedIn as well. So um, there's a feedback form um, that you can um, fill up, help us to improve our future uh, sessions as well when you exit the webinar as well. So, um, Craig, any messages you'd like to share before uh, we close the webinar? Uh, apart from uh, be safe, um, let's all look that 2021 will be a better year for us than 2020. Um, and make your resolutions for 2021 and be responsible to over this uh, Christmas period. Great, uh, great message there. So, happy holidays in advance from Spectrum and uh, see you at our next event. Look out for it. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend, people. Bye.